Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you've been sitting in the shadows, or if you are new here, and you enjoy what you are listening to, please don't forget to show that subscribe button some love. And also, don't forget the notification bell. Make sure that one's set to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which happens to be daily. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Warning, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is advised. When I was around 20 years old, I started getting love letters in the mail. At first, there was no return address. Eventually, the third letter I received was from my much older, mentally unstable neighbor. He expressed how much he loved and needed me. He wanted a family and so on. He told me he had been watching me since I was a little girl. That part really creeped me out. I've been knowing him my entire life and I've never had a clue. I don't know how he knew where I worked at, but there were a few times he would sit on the bench down the street from my job and watch me walk to and from my car. He sat on that bench, still as a rock, and only followed me with his eyes. After that, I told my dad and grandfather, and they went to go talk to him, and eventually, he stopped, and basically fell off the face of the earth. Never seen him again. To this day, I often wondered, when I was outside playing as a little girl, what if he had kidnapped me? I'm so thankful he never made a move from that time forward. I am very aware of my surroundings. As of now. Here's a little background. I, a 24 year old female, live with my roommate, a 23 year old female, in an apartment in the suburbs of Atlanta. As you may know, Atlanta is super dangerous and crime riddled right now. So, we have a ring peephole camera, perfect for apartments, and a digital lock on our door for safety. Now, on to the story. About three months ago, the sweet family from across the hall moved out, and we got a new neighbor. His name is David, and let's just say he's interesting. When we first saw him moving in, we were a bit taken aback by the sheer amount of stuff he was trying to fit into his one-bedroom apartment. All of it was anime merch and Star Wars memorabilia. Definitely gave me hoarder vibes, but not my business. When the moving trucks left and a few days had passed, my roommate and I knocked on his door and gave him a welcome to the neighborhood gift basket with some baked goods, dog treats, and poop bags for his dog, and, of course, seasonal candles. Apparently, this was not the correct thing to do. After that day, David got creepy. He started out innocent enough. He would come to the door whenever he heard me or my roommate coming or going to have a quick chat, or he would come over regularly to ask for salt or sugar or toilet paper. Sometimes he would ask if we could come over and watch his dog, but within the past two weeks, Things have really escalated. Two weekends ago, we were out pretty late, partying at the bars near the Brave Stadium. We ended up getting home at around 3 a.m., only to find David sitting at the top of the stairs, waiting for us. He acted all upset, asked us where we had been, and requested that we tell him if we were planning to be out past midnight. I laughed in his face, and he called me a mindless Stacy. I still don't know what that means or what he meant by it. He also asked for access to our ring doorbell so he could make sure we are safe. We laughed at him again and went into our apartment. Here's the scary part. We checked the ring the next morning, 
and he sat outside his apartment staring at our door for the rest of the night. When we saw that, we contacted the complex to let them know that he was acting crazy. They told us to contact the police, so we did. The police told us to contact them if he made any threats, but since we lived in a shared space, they couldn't do anything until he entered our apartment or threatened us. I assume the complex said something to him because he left us alone for the next five days or so. This week, he is out of control. He is constantly sitting outside of our apartment. My roommate has started leaving for work an hour earlier so that she doesn't cross paths with him. I cannot leave the apartment during the day because he is constantly waiting outside for me. He has asked me out, left the love letters on our door, on our cars, and in our mailbox. I told him once that I wasn't interested, and he told me that he would kill himself if I didn't go out on a date with him. Of course, I don't have that in writing, so the police won't do shit. He has also put up a ring doorbell of his own so he can keep track on all of our movements and will leave really creepy sexual notes when we're gone so we find them when we come back. What do we do? All right, here's a couple of updates here. Thank you all for your feedback. For now, my brother is spending the night on my couch for the next few nights until we can have a sit-down meeting with my landlord. We have collected all the evidence and ring footage so we can show how much this has progressed. I'm sure the landlord and the police think we're being dramatic, little girls or whatever. So, we're not going to take no for an answer. Either he leaves or we break our lease and get our full security deposit back. We are also going to file for a temporary restraining order at the very minimum because someone had said that would be faster than going through the police. Again, thank you all so much for the advice. Here's your update number two. Number one, we met with our landlord last week. Unfortunately, they aren't willing to work with us as much as we had expected. They will not remove him from his unit. Since we didn't want to spend a ton of money to move, we asked if we could move units within the complex. The landlord offered us a one-bedroom unit on the terrace level. So... My roommate and I would have to share the room in what is basically the basement of our building. Not ideal. Number two, we spoke to the police and they said that the notes and letters weren't enough to get someone on stalking or harassment, especially since he lives literally three feet away from us. He probably just thinks you're cute, is what they said. They did keep the ring doorbell footage and said that they would contact us sometime this week, after they've reviewed all of the footage. Number three, we have both moved in with my parents for the time being. Shout out to them for being incredible parents. It really sucks spending 2,000 plus monthly on a place you can't live. We are actively looking for our other apartments, but money is tight since we have to buy out the current lease and pay to start a new one. Also not ideal. Shortly after moving in to my first apartment, I started having strange encounters with one of my neighbors on laundry night. I would pass through my car's carport when it rained to get to the laundry mat. He stood in the shadows a bit and startled me several times possibly avoiding the rain. I tried to be friendly, but he would just stare at me, smoking his cigarettes and not have a word to say. Soon, it became a regular routine for him, and then the apartment across the way opened up, and he moved to that one instead. I changed laundry to a daytime-only event. One night, I sat on my stoop on my phone and noticed a red light in the distance. It was him, sitting in the dark, with a video camera pointed straight at me. I went inside to tell my friend, who had just been crashing at my place for a few weeks, freaked out and relieved about the timing. That night, my friend staying with me went out, and when he was gone, 
I heard loud bangs that sounded far away, but I used a sound machine to help me sleep, so I still couldn't be sure what it was. The next day, leaving, we noticed the door wood around the deadbolt was all mushed up. I asked him if he noticed when he came back, but it was late and he was a little drunk, so he wasn't sure. The maintenance people were very concerned because it looked like someone tried to break in while I was home alone. Shortly after that, I left and got a new apartment. Luckily, my new roommate had an amazing big dog, and when she was out of town one night, I woke up at like 3 a.m. to him growling at her window. I went over and ensured it was locked. The next day, my neighbors asked me if I locked myself out, and I asked, no, why? Sure enough, the screen on the outside was all twisted, as if somebody tried to break in, but got interrupted by a very big dog. The worst part was I had out-of-state plates, and all of my friends kept telling me to get them switched because I was sticking out to the police. I often thought that he tracked me down by plates and tried again, or maybe I was just paranoid. And these were a series of break-ins, looking for money, jewelry, etc. This happened around summer 2000 in Midwest, USA, and I was a 12-year-old boy. I was shy and never did well with confrontation. Anytime I was scared, I'd feel myself shaking. One day, my dad and cousin were weightlifting in the garage, and it was open. I then decided to grab my bicycle out of the garage and ride up and down the street while my dad and cousin lifted. As I'm pedaling away from my house, I see another kid riding his bike, probably five to six houses down for mine, but he just kind of kept going in circles. I maybe get like 20 feet near him, but that's it. No words were exchanged, not even a wave or a nod. I just kept my head down and kept pedaling. On the next circle, back down the street, that's when things got weird. I got near the area where the kid had been riding, and he's not around anymore. So I guess he went inside, wherever he lived. Right as I'm about to turn around and head towards my house, which is like 80 to 100 yards away, I hear a man yell, Hey! In an unsettling tone. I looked up, and a man is standing in his front doorway, probably 25 feet from me, as I'm paused on the street with my bike. He's one of the creepiest looking dudes I've ever seen in my life. He has on a baseball cap, and he's wearing those thick Jeffrey Dahmer-looking glasses. Tan burnt orange, dirty-looking, wrinkled skin, and had to be in his 40s, probably. He looked straight out of a horror movie, and just had the sinister, angry look on his face. He then says, If you say anything to my son again, I'm going to run your ass over. At this point, I was crying and frozen in fear, but... Then I start biking home even faster. I've never been in a situation like this in all my life. I could not believe what just happened because I never said anything to that boy. So I get to the open garage where my dad and cousin are still lifting, tell them the story, and they decide to go to the guy's house and address the situation that just occurred. My dad and cousin had a few beers and are pretty jacked, so... They were ready to tussle if needed. My dad goes straight to the guy's door with my cousin behind him and knocks loudly. The man opens the door and has this huge rock riler right by his side barking and going crazy at my dad and cousin. He threatens to let the dog loose, but my dad and cousin aren't carrying down one bit. After a bit of bickering for a minute, the guy goes inside his house and shuts the door. Nothing else happens that night, and we walk back home. A few days pass, and now I'm about to get to the creepiest part. During the summer, when my parents worked during the day, my grandma would come over and babysit my little brother and I. 
We were about 10 minutes from downtown, and my grandma was going to take us there to grab food at Sonic. We get into her car and start driving around the road towards that creepy guy's house. This made me feel very uneasy, and that's the direction we had to go. As we got closer to the house, the hair on my neck starts to stand up again. As we go by the house, I see him. He's sitting in a red truck in his driveway, facing the road like he's about to pull out. I don't remember well, but I think he must have even had a grin on his face as we drove by. We pass the house and he pulls out behind us. I start freaking out a bit, so I tell my grandma the story about the man driving behind us. At first, my grandma was chill about it, but then I noticed she seemed to be shaken. This is because she had made six to seven turns to throw him off our trail, but he kept following us. Every little turn. At this point, me and my brother are in the back seat with our heads down as he follows us. But luckily, we made it downtown where it was busy. We get near the police station, I believe, and take another turn. Then finally, he just passes on by. I never saw the man again. My mom and dad split up, and we left that neighborhood two years later with my mom to move to the country. My dad still lives at that same house, and I wonder if that dude stuck around for a while, or even still lives at that house. What was his intent? Was it just a coincidence, or did he plan on following us? It was so weird how it looked like he was just waiting in his driveway for us to pass on by. I've never only started thinking about this in the last 10 to 15 years, but I think I nearly escaped being raped and or murdered as a kid. When I was a preteen growing up in rural Texas, a family from Las Vegas moved next to us. It was Harry, that was his real name, and his wife, her mother, two daughters, and one of their husbands. I was drawn to them because they were very friendly and interesting, all except Harry. It didn't take very long to figure out that everyone in the family hated him. He gave off a real dirtbag vibe. The family had money, but he came from his wife's side of the family. He didn't really fit in with the rest of them. Over a year or so, I spent more and more time over there, but avoided Harry like the plague. Talking to his stepdaughters, I learned that their mother was getting ready to divorce him. I think he could see the writing on the wall as well. One day, out of the blue, he stopped over at my house. I was outside, riding my bike or something. He asked me if I wanted to take a ride with him to check on their cattle. For some stupid reason, I forgot all of my misgivings about him. I thought it might be cool to take a ride with him out in the country to check on the livestock. My mother was inside talking to a friend on the phone. I'll never forget how she reacted when I asked her if I could go with him. Without interrupting her conversation, she mouthed no and shook her head to reiterate the point. She told me to just go to the front door and shake my head rather than going outside and telling him I was going. Harry just shrugged and left. After his wife finally kicked him out, Harry started harassing them in weird ways creeping outside their house at night and even calling in fake obituaries for one of the daughters into the local newspaper. Thankfully, he took off back to Vegas soon after. After I had kids of my own, I started thinking about that incident and what could have happened to me that day if my mother hadn't had the foresight to tell me I could not go. I think Harry would have hurt me just to get back at his family members who had a fondness for me. It's chilling just to sit here and write this down and remember how close I could have gotten to something really bad. So I moved into a duplex with my ex about three years ago in what we thought was a safer part of the city. 
One of the neighbors, Amber, works in the duplex rental office, and her husband, Ed, was at the time fresh out of prison. Later would see all of the swastika tattoos and had been doing landscape work for the rentals, like mow the lawns, cut down trees, etc. Other than that, he is home mostly doing odds and ends, things like tinkering with his mower or truck or something. They both are super nice people, very kind and loving towards others, and always offer to help out. We have smoked weed together a few times, Ed smokes more than Amber does, and have talked about all kinds of things, so I thought I could trust them and felt very safe being their neighbor. I once mentioned how sometimes when I'm home alone, I hear steps in the attic over my room and what sounds like a chair being dragged how sometimes the noise follows me around the house and always freaks me out to the point of calling someone just to feel a little safer until the noise died down. Ed asked, Wait, you think we're spying on you? In a laughing way, but it creeped me out a little. So then, I break up with my boyfriend and he moves out. This is recent, so just a few months ago. Ed started texting me, asking if I wanted to smoke while Amber was still at work. I declined every time, finding different excuses because I still felt uncomfortable around him. Then, he asked if I wanted to have sex with him because he thinks Amber is cheating on him. Uh, I definitely shut that one down, and it was awkward as fuck. I didn't tell Amber because I didn't want to get kicked out or have some horrible, awkward tension, and I hate confrontation, so I kept quiet. That's when I start to hear things in the attic above my room more often. It freaked me out, even more when I woke up to a loud bang outside my door at about 3 or 4 a.m. Then, I went to examine it. There was a small lockpick stuck in my door, on the ground, but no one around. I kept the lockpick, and the next day I texted a picture of it to Amber to let her know I thought someone was creeping around, and she said, Oh, uh, that's Ed's. That's his ice pick, not a lockpick, sweetie. No one can pick your deadbolt with that. But I know the difference in a four-inch skinny-ass lockpick and an ice pick. I'm so scared to be alone here, especially at night. Our addicts connect, and it's not outlandish to think he could be up there, spying on me. I even found a freshly drilled hole in the ceiling of my room. I just put wadded up paper in it and tried not to think of it. I honestly hope nothing comes of it, and I'm just being paranoid. I'll preface this by saying I live in a very creepy neighborhood. I have tons of stories that I will share later on. I am happy to clear anything up. I, a 15-year-old male, live in a two-bed, three-bath house. My room is quite small and only has room for a bed, a desk, and a bookshelf. I enjoy reading and writing music, so it's not super ideal, but it works. Let's start with the first time this started happening. Chapter 1. The Man Next Door, Three Months Ago Our neighbor is an old man. We'll refer to him as John for privacy reasons. Maybe 60 or 70. He lives all alone and his house is a dump. Weeds climbing the tall walls with paint peeling and water stains covering the surface. His bedroom window is right across from my bedroom window. So if I were to look outside, I could most likely see him in his room and vice versa. It was 11 p.m. and I was sitting at my desk, which faces the window, by the way, and I decided to look up for my book. And out the window, I noticed that the lights were on in John's room. I didn't think much of it at first, but... Then I noticed a little flash coming from the corner of the window. I looked a little closer, and I realized that these were the man's spectacles reflecting off of something. But more disturbing, the man was watching me. 
I don't know how long he was watching or why, but I was completely freaked out beyond all description. I decided to close the blinds and go to sleep. Tomorrow, I would go over to his house to ask him why he was watching me. Chapter 2 The Point of Annoying Turning to Creepy One Week Ago At this point, seeing the old man had become less of a joy and more of a fear. He would ask me deep and all kinds of disturbing questions. I believe he once asked me, as I was taking my dog for a walk, if you could, would you ever skin a child? And other shit I won't even mention here. Now, I was in my room again. I had caught the old man watching me a few times. But since it was 2 a.m. and I decided to open the blinds, surely the man was asleep and I could enjoy watching the stars. I opened the blinds slowly, but to my horror, the man was still up and even worse, he has moved a rocking chair to the window where he could watch me. His lights were off, but it was clear he was still awake. I shut the blinds immediately and turned off my lights. I heard a curse from outside my window, then silence. I decided that I would never look out that window at night again. Chapter 3 My Worst Nightmare Last Night Last night, I was laying on my bed, sleep not coming to me. It had been a very busy day, and I was processing everything that happened. When I heard something hit my window, I just assumed it was a bird or something, so I closed my eyes again. But this time, I heard another bang from my window. This time, I got up and slowly peeked out of the blinds. My neighbor wasn't in his window so I thought it would be safe to open my blinds completely. And I did just that. And what I saw next shocked me. I looked all around and didn't see anything. Until I looked down. There was a man in our yard, smiling. His grin was wide, his teeth were yellow, his eyes glinting in the moonlight. That was it. That was fucking it. I slammed the blinds shut and ran to my parents' room. I told them all about the man next door and everything that had happened these past three months. They calmed me down and then told me they were going to look out my window. And so they did. But in the time it took for me to explain that, all of that to them and for them to calm me down, the man had somehow retreated back to his room and lay sleeping in his rocking chair, away from the window. My parents chalked it up to sleep paralysis or some shit like that. And so, I went back to sleep. But in the morning, I would receive the best news of my life. Chapter 4. Dream Come True I was woken up at 7 a.m. by the sound of the doorbell. I groggily got up and put on my clothes. Important note I forgot to mention. I sleep naked, so that makes it weirder. I went downstairs and my parents turned around and told me that John had told them that he was moving away and that he would be gone by noon. I now feel safe in my own room again. In my teens, I had my fair share of encounters with creepy older men. This happened when I was 15, over a decade ago. Boy, I'm starting to feel old. I've told this particular story to friends for years, but I've never shared it publicly. Until now. There were a lot of long stretches of industrial area in the town that I grew up in. Large plazas with big parking lots stuck next to one another and wide open stretches of road and highway. The majority of my town felt like the area before an airport, flat, gray, and functional. As a depressed teenager, I used to go out after school a lot by myself. First, it was within my neighborhood, but it escalated to me leaving the quaint residential areas to walk an hour or two in either direction. I'd usually make my way home before dark, 
and I had a trusty flip phone at the time to call my parents if I needed to. Generally, I felt pretty safe walking on the main streets because of how populous they were. There were always plenty of cars on the road, and there were quite a few pedestrians out and about. One early summer evening, and about dusk, I was making my way home from one of my walks. It was a route I had taken a lot, and I was about a 40-minute walk from home. I was just passing a parking lot when a car pulled out in front of me. I stopped about two feet from the vehicle to let it turn onto the road, but the driver rolled down his window. Hey, how are you? He asked. The man looked to be in his late forties and greeted me with an unsettling enthusiasm. I wasn't sure how to respond, but since I couldn't pass his car, I hoped he just needed directions or something. Um, I'm okay. How are you? Before I could even finish my response, he says, I love your style. Goth girls in boots are one of my fetishes. I am not paraphrasing. Now, as I said, I'd been approached quite a few times by creepy men, but this guy was beyond bold. I had absolutely no idea how to respond. Just as I was going to try to formulate a response, a car pulled up behind him, meaning that he was blocking another car from exiting the parking lot. Um, there's a car behind you trying to get out. I tell him, relieved that I now have a way to get out of this conversation. I'll meet you in the next parking lot, he exclaims. And as I try to tell him no, that I need to get home, he drives off. In my mind, there was no way he could be serious. I continue walking, but... Sure enough, he's in the parking lot, waiting. The parking lot he'd entered was down a bit of a hill, and he was standing beside his car. As soon as he saw me, he started waving me down. I'd been followed by cars before, and I was generally afraid of the idea of making a man angry and being stalked to my home. I assessed the situation. He was parked at about ten feet from a dive bar and there were about 15 men outside on the patio, which meant that they could see us, and it would be an air shot if I screamed. I weighed the options between going down to meet him versus potentially being followed home, and made the stupid decision to walk down the slight incline. I honestly don't know why I didn't just pretend to be on the phone or call my mom. I don't remember what he said when I approached, but I kept my distance from him and his car, so I wouldn't be easy to kidnap. He walked around to his trunk, and I felt myself tense up and take a step back. He then pulls out a pair of women's boots and approached me slightly to show them to me. They were lace up, about mid-calf, maybe size nine. Nice, aren't they? He asks me. Um, yeah. I respond hesitantly. They were not nice, but my brain was on autopilot. Wanna try them on for me? He asks, grinning. I'm absolutely stunned, more than scared. I'm completely baffled that this is actually happening. I, I think I'm a little young for you. I managed to stammer out. No, you're what, like 20? I'm 15. All of the blood leaves his face, and he finally realizes that he's made a huge mistake. He quickly puts the boots back in his trunk and says something to the effect of, Oh, oh I'm sorry, you're just so hot. I, I shouldn't be saying that. You're 15. I kind of laughed him off and exit gracefully. He drives out of there well above the speed limit. I'm relieved but left absolutely bewildered and creeped out. Why was he carrying around a pair of women's boots? How many women did he approach? What the fuck just happened? What would have happened if I was over 18? Why did his brain think that what he just did was okay, even if I had been old enough? I still can't wrap my head around everything that just happened, and if he thought that it would actually work even if I was an adult, 
in my late 20s now, which means that if he approached me today, he probably would be more consistent. I hope I don't ever see him again. So, I moved to a new place. I'm Indian, and I frequently go to Indian grocery stores. I've been to this store a couple of times since I moved. I'm short and did something silly during checkout. I was helplessly trying to reach for the divider to separate the groceries in the checkout line. I looked around, hoping nobody noticed, and this cashier guy is smiling at the whole situation. I smile back and try to get done with checkout ASAP. From that day onwards, I find this guy trying to grab my attention. He looks at least a decade older than me, quite tall. I find him staring at me quite a lot, walking through the aisles where I'm shopping, just taking glances. This happened twice or thrice, and then he starts walking up to me casually, asking questions like, How are you? He doesn't seem to come to me when I'm with my friend, but when I'm alone. I find him lingering around. One day, he just kept trying to give me free snacks. I said no, but he handed over to me and left. The next day, he asks if I have a job and if I'm married. He kind of gets excited when I tell him that I'm a developer and single. He doesn't speak English. He proceeds to say something in Hindi, which I'm not super good at. I try asking him what, and he said something, but I don't understand. Also, there have been instances where he would step out of the store and watch me while I'm sitting in my car until I leave. He just smirks and keeps looking at me. I'm a shy introvert. I am bad at avoiding conversations. I always talk nice regardless of who it is. What should I do now? Does this mean that he is interested in me? How do I politely handle this? He kind of knows who I usually shop with, and I don't want to make it an awkward situation for my friends. Am I overreacting? To clarify, I'm not interested in this person. I always smile and talk. Maybe that's sending him the wrong signals. This is giving me a weird, not-so-good feeling. I could stop going to that store, but that doesn't seem right. The fact that I have to avoid a public space because of a man makes me feel pathetic, but I understand in terms of safety. Maybe I can always go with someone there if I have to. Not sure if that's the right thing to do. Like it is the only Indian grocery store around. The situation is an inconvenience at this point. I hope anyone that has been through something like this is or are in a better situation with peace. Definitely makes it awkward to get unwanted attention from random people. Thank you for the ones that gave me feedback. I will avoid going to that store for a long time as much as possible. If I do have to go, I'm going to have my friend with me at all times. Being at the store myself is giving him the opportunity to make advances or create situations where I cannot get away from him easily. Oh yeah, here's a quick update. I'm never going back to that store. I had to go today to get a few things for my friend. She had surgery. She didn't want to come along. She is fine to go out. But I dragged her with me. She had noticed that man all these months. I've been going to the store alone for the past couple of weeks, so I was just openly flirty today. He would avoid approaching me if I'm with someone. That wasn't the case today. He was outside the store when we had reached there. He smiled at us and went inside, then stood at the entrance to get a close-up. He leaned towards me and said hi, just the gesture. Obviously, a lot of people noticed, including my friend. He kept smiling, looking at me all the time. The store manager was there, and he didn't seem to bother. After we reached back home, I told my friend that I'm never going back there. 
I asked her if I was overreacting, and she said no. She's the one who told me to ignore him while shopping and wear headphones. Today was subtle because I was with her. He didn't talk much otherwise. He'd be standing in front of me asking personal questions. My friend said that she won't take me there for the longest and decided to go there only if we're a group of three or more with guys from our friend circle. All right, everyone, I've gotten experience to post that my boyfriend and I went through just a few days ago. This is long, but here goes. I'm still scared. We recently moved to Salem, Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago and had a place set up with roommates, but it fell through at the last minute and we were left stranded with nowhere to go for the night. We walked to a nearby town to try and find a place to sleep for the night until we were able to figure things out. Boyfriend is working and I'm still looking for a job and have several interviews next week. Anyways, on with the story. So after having nowhere to go and being desperate, it's also around 3 a.m. So my boyfriend posts a Craigslist ad reaching out for help. I know Craigslist is risky and this story is why. Someone responded to the ad and offered us a place and we found our way to the address. When we got there, an old, disheveled, and very dirty-looking man was at his garage on a big hill littered with old campers, trailers, and abandoned vehicles. It looked like a literal junkyard. We introduce ourselves and he tells us he's got a place in this shack in an attic. My boyfriend was sketched out and so was I, but... We were so exhausted from walking all night that we really, really needed sleep, so we took it. The attic was filthy and cold, 40 degrees or less, and there was a dirty mattress and some blankets. He said he took in a junky couple, but they left without notice months ago. Really sketch, but I desperately needed to sleep. He let us sleep for a day, and when we woke up, we decided to go to a nearby McDonald's to charge our phones and see if any friends answered, if we could stay with them temporarily. The guy, Richard, starts texting my phone and leaving me voicemails saying how we don't trust him and why did we leave. So I sent a text back saying we were charging our phones and we'd be back to talk to him. After that, he sent me a text saying in all caps, I guess you don't trust me, bye. I'm just like, what the fuck? So, I call him and explain the situation, and he starts saying how we need to come back so he can talk to us about the place. We come back, and he's very visibly drunk. He starts rambling on about how he's not a child molester and how we're stupid for going to McDonald's to charge our phones, and we're stupid for buying food from McDonald's because he already made food for us. I wanted to leave it then and there, but I don't know anyone here. My boyfriend does, but his friends all live with their parents and everyone said no to us, staying with them. So, boyfriend goes to the store to get some smokes and I stayed behind to help creepy Richard with stuff in the yard. He starts almost interrogating me, asking would I die for my boyfriend? Do I trust him? How much do I love him? I tell him yes, I trust him, and I love him. He tells me I'm stupid, and that he's just gonna leave me, and it won't work out. We've been together three years, and are very close. He would never leave me because we're very loyal to each other. Richard then stands up and starts kind of darting around back and forth around me, like he's staring at me and around me. Kind of like he's trying to read me, in a sense. I asked him what he was doing because it made me uncomfortable, and he shook his head as if coming out of a trance and apologized. Then, he said I was stupid for trusting my boyfriend, and he then says again how he's not a child molester. No one even said anything remotely relevant to this. 
So I was suspicious that he kept trying to stress to us he wasn't a molester. Then he tells me that he's a mean person and has been accused of killing and raping people, but that he's not a rapist, but he's killed someone. I start panicking and boyfriend returns. We are alone in the attic and I tell him what happened with Richard and he's panicked and we're not sure what to do because no one can take us in and we didn't have enough money for a motel until a few days later when he got paid. So we tried to stick it out a bit and decide if Richard tries something, we can protect ourselves. Next day, boyfriend goes to work and I'm here alone and very scared. I have my phone and I am able to talk to my boyfriend while he's at work. Richard keeps finding excuses to come up to the attic and talk to me. He asks me if I want to take a shower at some random guy's house I don't know. I said no and made up an excuse about not wanting to get sick with wet hair. He asks again and again trying to convince me and I said no, I'm not leaving without my boyfriend. He finally leaves me alone about it but still keeps finding excuses to come to talk to me. Boyfriend finally comes back after work and I'm really panicked and crying and begging to leave. We figure something out and we are able to get to his mom's. That night, Richard comes up to the attic saying he's got to talk to my boyfriend and I go with him into his camper trailer with my boyfriend. There's a huge computer monitor hooked up to a TV with a naked woman. There are stacks of adult pornography DVDs all over the place. The place reeks of a horrid smell we can't describe. I wanted to leave right then and there. Finally, we attempt to sleep one more night there, and at around 4 a.m. in the shack below us, we hear a lot of banging and hammering and all kinds of loud noises. We're both panicked and stay quiet since he's right below us. We hear him talking to himself in full conversation as if someone was around. No, he was not on his phone. After about an hour, he comes up there and starts asking my boyfriend to help him with some heavy loading of junk into a truck. Boyfriend says no and explains we're leaving and we have to be somewhere to catch the train at a specific time that morning. Richard gets visibly irritated and tries to keep us there again. Finally, we're able to leave. My boyfriend's mom gets us and I start crying and begging to please not take us back there. She's confused because she doesn't know what's happened because boyfriend was scared to tell her. Finally, we tell her the whole story and she's concerned and empathetic with us. She says she's going to make sure we don't go back. I was looking on Craigslist to see about apartment rentals and I see Richard's ad about needing a female roommate and wants pictures and such. I knew it was him because he said he was moving to Maine soon and he told us a lot about his plan to actually move to Maine. There's currently about eight ads on Craigslist, all from him, looking for a female roommate in Salem and he's 53 years old, named Richard and moving to Maine. This scared me even more because I don't know if he's trying to lure in females or not. If boyfriend never showed up from work, I know I'd probably be dead by now. I got horrible vibes from that man and honestly thought we'd die there. I have his phone number and wanted to see if I could find his full name to do a internet arrest search. I was unable to get results without paying and I can't afford that. I'm debating placing an anonymous call to the cops about his address and what he's saying about he killed someone and everyone says he's a molester. I never want to see that place ever, ever again. And that, dear listeners, is going to bring a close to these true creepy encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special thank you 
to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Sugar Spite, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every last one of you for your continued support to Back to Ashes. It means a lot. More than I can put into words. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these creepy stories. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.